Yeah. All right, guys. We took a little break. The gift had to use the loo. Yeah. And exactly. um, what were we talking about? That, well, uh, we were talking about the whole situation with Kai and Generation Iron. But but I want to just touch on that for just a brief second. Because, but it's hard not to get into this because you and I had never really. We've talked many times on the phone about this. Yeah. And, and in person about. And it's this. a very sensitive subject because it was something that going in, we weren't. We got blindsided. And it was completely blindsided. Well, I mean, also, we, I was never part of the conversation. Right. I found out about it later where you're like, look, I not, remember yeah. what I told you. I said, be careful. You don't have final cut. Right. And you're like, no, man, they're going to be they're going to make everybody look good. They're doing a remake of Pumping Iron and I'm going to play like the Arnold role. And they want me to kind of be like confident and a little, little bit arrogant. But they want me to play this role because they're trying to build it up and then. It's like uh, almost kind of like a Rocky story because now they're going to try to build up Kai as the underdog. But the crazy thing about it is it wasn't a movie. They tried to push it off as a documentary and they're like, we want you to act this way. And then you're like, okay, I'm going to be this guy who drives a Bentley who has this big home and has all of these nice Which things. Which is all true shit. You know? Well, but it was they, true shit, but it was this. built up though. Yeah. And then Kai had an Escalade and had all this stuff, but they were like, they brought him in from where he might've been 10 years prior into like, you know, obviously he had yeah, a former little, residence that he was using to house his freaking art probably. And then made it seem like he had nothing. And it was, and the problem was, look, I enjoyed filming it. Right. I really did because you know, you're missing your feel. You're feeling like a bureau produ- and a part of a, a cool dude, production. Like your whole goal again, as a pro bodybuilder is to do what? To mimic Arnold. Right. To win the Mr. Olympia, find a way to Hollywood. Yeah. It was as simple as that, you know. This was synonymous to pump and iron, you know. Like, you're thinking, okay, well, I'm the champion. Let's run with this. Right. And bodybuilding is going to win. Why not? So, you know, they park a freaking RV outside of my old house in Denver, right, for a week. And um, we go to the mountains. They got me running and shit. Yep. Doing all this other stuff. I was like, man, this is a lot of work, man. But all right, for the betterment of the of the film, you know, you're sacrificing your body mm-hmm. to do certain things. Um, I'm being honest, you know, during the interviews and that stuff. That was during the 212 year, right? Yeah. Yep. So everything I said, I mean, look, like I felt that shit. It wasn't like fabricating stuff, but they were just like, yeah, just pour it on a little bit. Like if you want. And I was like, all right, cool. Yeah. And there was a lot of things I was saying that didn't make the final cut, which was, you know, I was pointing out the flaws of all these other guys. I was pointing out what they were going to do on stage because you and I both know it is about what I present, yeah. but it's about what we're going against. So we have to study. Like For me, I was always studying mm-hmm. my opponent, how they pose, and then how I can accentuate my pose next to them to destroy them. And I was making jokes, I, so many jokes that they they had to cut so many times because you weren't there. you know. Like, no, I wasn't and, at any of the filming but, but, except uh, for when we were in the room. Uh, and then I think they took a filming of maybe us working out. Yeah, that was and yeah. So so let's fast forward. The Olympia in 2012. Yep. We go in there, we kick ass, we get perfect score. Yeah. Fallacy number one. It was not um, when when only one point. It wasn't one point. In fact, that was a voiceover. Um, I think Bob, it was from the 212. Or two, so two Bob Chicarillo was on stage. And this is where, like, you and I would get frustrated. We're like, fans, I'm not going to call you stupid, but, like, how the fuck do you not watch the video of the Olympia, which was available? But they don't do that. Phil, you're so, giving people I, too much I, credit. I know. This is the you're problem. I know. too much I know, credit. I'm having They're only sense. watching the film. I know. So here's the fun. So we're on stage. I mean, Kai for God's I, sake, they took – Branch's video that they he asked them explicitly not to put the scene of him falling off the horse, which they and teased then, that horse with that freaking boom mic, and and they, the and, they, and, they, and, they, and and that's what caused it. Almost and he the almost guy. killed the guy, right? And, right? and and Branch is such a good dude, and I'm just sitting here going like, what the f? He's so they're so lucky he didn't pull out a freaking you know what and. <laughs> <laughs> let him have it. You know what but I mean? But I'm just like, that's why the whole thing, you know? Or, wild, or how about Dennis Wolf when he was trying to <laughs> do the they, acting? They, they set him up, bro. Right? Like, I mean, And so. it was the whole thing. And look, I get it. They're, 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 
they're trying to do what they're trying to do for the best, uh, you know, like entertainment. Yeah, for their brand. Yeah. For their brand. But mm -hmm. at the expense of this, and this is this is my question to you. It made you into the villain. Oh. Okay. The you, first thing, bro. But, that's, but that's, let me let me yeah. let me finish this. Yeah, go ahead. It made you into the villain. Do you feel that you became more of that villain for real life because of that? Oh, I see what you're saying. So like, oh, absolutely. Because here I am trying to explain myself to people mm -hmm. like, no, no, no. Like, that's not really me. Like, that's how they painted it and shit. I win the 2012 Olympia. We do the Generation Iron stuff. Mm -hmm. We go to the premiere. One in L.A., one in New York. You know what you tell me? I don't know, bro. I don't know if this is going to work. I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah, man, like, it almost makes you look like, like, you just been handed everything. You don't work hard for shit. And they just painted this narrative, man. Like, and you had the foresight. And I was like, damn. So the good thing was 2013, I whipped everybody's fucking ass. Right. Um, I mean, came out with the Hattori Hanzo sword. And, I mean, we just whooped their ass. Did one freaking call yeah, out. Yeah, you looked amazing that year. And, and we just destroyed them. But the problem was the day after it released, Bob Chicarillo was actually hosting the Generation Iron premiere mm -hmm. inside the Orleans and hotel. And I sat front row and I heard everything everyone had to say. What were they saying? Fucking douchebag, piece of shit, like this and that. And I'm like, whoa, this is crazy. About you. Yeah, like how did I affect your life like this? So I'm listening there, to this People were shit. very emotionally charged. Like, wow, like... Last night you were cheering for me, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like you're appreciating yeah. what I had. Now you're going here. So then um, the lights go on. Bob Chicks and 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 our three time Mr. Olympia Phil Heath is here. Hands me the microphone. I'm like, how's everybody doing? <laughs> y'all like the movie? They're like, yeah. I was like, heard what y'all was saying. Like y'all, what do y'all think about my part? Hey, fucking dick. Guy said it, and I was like, it's interesting. Yeah. So I had to. So. Right then and there, I had to realize, okay, this is their this is their truth, right? Like you can't. It's their narrative. You, you it's can't. their story. And I was like, damn, it's like that. Honey was right. Like, man, like I thought this would be great for the sport. This and that. Yeah, it might have been great for the sport. It wasn't great for Phil Heath. No. So then, at that point in time, you know, I did another premiere in Denver. And what was crazy about that shit was, uh, here I am in my home city, mm -hmm. where I put them on the map. As an open class bodybuilder, IBB Pro, I think I was like like one of the, well, you know, I was the most accomplished bodybuilder ever come out of Colorado. Like we already know this, right? Put them on a map, and I got people there after the event. I remember this lady; she was a doctor, and she was like, "Yeah, you know, I was trying to do like a signing and a meet and greet." She was like, "Yeah, like I just think you're an arrogant asshole," and I was like, and her husband's like, "Like shut up, itch, like you know what I mean? Like this guy's about to whoop my ass, like like shut up, man! Like you know you're talking to this guy, two hundred eighty pounds, man, like whoop my ass." And I was like, you know, I appreciate your input, mm. man, but like, why? Like, what makes me so bad that, why? Because I live in Arvada, Colorado, and I got a, you know, million dollar house that I earned through the sport of bodybuilding, the sport that I sacrificed everything to be a part of. You know what I'm saying? Like, because yeah. I drive a Bentley and I got a, a, a Land Rover, I got this, you know what I'm saying? I got a Mercedes. And what are you talking about? Like, don't you like success? Would, would you rather talk about people being broke and like sacrificing their bodies? doing PDs, having nothing to show for it. That's what's inspirational to you. So it was like that people are just like victim mentality, man. Like they, they, they like, uh, you know, the, the, the person, the rags to riches story. And I'm like, but you don't understand like Kai green beat me at the Arnold classic. You're expect you're, you're not. And then I just realized like, you guys just don't get it. Like it's okay. And then to answer your question, I just allowed it to just like burn, 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 burn. And then turn it into the freaking dream killer. I was like, fuck these guys then. Yeah. If that's how they're going to be, going for number four, dude. <sighs> and here you are yeah. exhaling because you know no. it wasn't fair. And even like people in our industry was like, like making it tougher for us, making it tougher for you, telling me how to act, yeah. telling me how to be. But then we were like, listen, you're telling Phil Heath how to speak, how to act. You told me one time, and I got pissed at you, like yeah. royally. You were like, Phil, man, I got to tell you something, bro. 
you got to like stop playing around so much. Stop joking around on tour and this and that. And I was like, bro, like we boys, man, we just, you know, yeah. talking shit, like having fun. And you're like, yeah, man, but people in the industry like coming up to me and saying like, you know, your boys like basically they're acting like Phil's getting really comfortable and he needs to be this way. And I'm like, OK, but a guy beat me that has literally a track record of things that aren't great, right. that aren't pristine. Right. I've done everything right in my entire life. Well, not everything, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I had some fucked up shit too, yeah, yeah. but nothing in comparison to, to the, some of the weird shit that we know Mr. Green has done, right? Right. Um, I never created any type of weird shit. You can't just Google my shit and see this weird shit. So you don't hold, then, I, then we both had to agree, they're holding you at a higher standard. They are. And they are. We, and now and we have to, and now we, and now we have to accept it beyond belief. So the expectations that they had, we have to have a hundred times greater. And we already did, but it was like, you're going against the internet now, social media now, the judges, everything. And then the competitors, the, comp the I tried to explain this to Derek Lunsford the other day. So, you know, winning the Olympia is hard. No question about it. If you're good enough to win it multiple times, it's not about if you can beat the bodybuilders on that stage. It's about managing expectations of others and managing life. Mm -hmm. That's the hardest part. Managing relationships, whether it be spouses, family, friends, business, you know, expectations from a promoter that may feel some type of way because you charged them a certain amount and they were friends with you when you were nothing and now they feel some type of way. Mm -hmm. You know, all this stuff. People just, it's just human nature and you have to do your best to just always be there for fans. And I always made sure. I mean, I was always there at the meet and greets. I never skipped one. I always gave them my time. I mean, but I didn't overexpose myself either and I just focused on the craft. I was thinking to myself like a Kobe, the late Kobe Bryant, like would Kobe be on social media? Like, no, nah, man, let's just do the work. Right. That's just, I don't have to talk about it, just be about that shit. And Generation 9 did not do me any favors, but it did me one. And that was, watch your back. Watch your narrative. But be great. Be so good that even, even if they want you to lose, you're just so good that they, you're undeniable. And that's what we did. We had to go to a place, and that was a scary one. That was the place where, you know, Tim Grover talks about the relentless mentality of being a cleaner and being that killer. You got to be a fucking killer. You run a company. You run a real company with Evigen. I've been your friend forever. It's not nice to have to sit here as Hani Rambod and be in control of an entire business that employs people who have families and have to deal with manufacturers and have to deal with ingredient people, different distributors that want to steal your product and sell it under map pricing and all this other stuff and ruin the name for their own personal benefit. It's going to drive you fucking insane. And it can bring you to tears at night. It can make you like, why am I doing this? I could just be an employee going to somebody else. You know what I'm saying? And no, you chose to be who you are and accept the unknown. So I got to see that even with you running your businesses and being married and having a child and doing all this. You sacrifice a lot. And we both went through these things. And fans shit on me at one point. And they... Um, they wonder why I would bark back a little bit online. Mm -hmm. Half the time I was taking a dump making fun of somebody because I thought it was funny as a former basketball player to talking shit back and they couldn't handle it. So then someone would say he's arguing with kids. Right. These were grown ass men. And then I realized you can't do that, Phil. You have a bigger calling. You're supposed to be this way, you know, like the ambassador, this and that. And I was like, but Muhammad Ali talked mad shit to people. Conor McGregor talked mad shit. Floyd Mayweather talked mad shit. Usain Bolt talked mad shit. Do your shit and make them beat you. And it never happened. I just lost. And that's okay. And I felt like what was really cool is that looking back, honey, is we had these moments where even, um, well, I think it was like going for number six, where the, the fans became 
a judge? It was that number seven? It was six or seven. Six or seven that so, they, they so, turned that on. So many. So many. <laughs> and see, this is the thing. And then I would tell right. Hani, I would tell, I, I would tell Hani, I'm like, I remember there was a couple years where we would be prepping for the show is a week of, and you know, I was Mr. Sa- quoted as Mr. Saturday night because Friday night I would come in with one version and we were so good enough to create a different version. Mm-hmm. And um, you were stressed, man. Very. Extremely stressed because now yeah. at, at, when you win number four and you're going for the fifth one, you're in uncharted territory, right? Like you're in, there's only Doring Yates, Arnold, Lee, Ronnie at that point. Yeah, and none of them had to deal with what you had to deal with. No. Which and is one million plus fans that would circle every single body part. Every single thing would be up online within minutes of the actual live event happening. And now you have millions of judges, not the seven or 11 or however many judges are now on the Olympia panel, but you have millions of them all breaking people down within seconds. If Dorian or somebody else had a torn bicep, something happened, you wouldn't see it in the magazines till three months after it happened. So you didn't have any of that clap back when it comes from the fans. Right. Now you have two days you have to peak right and you have two days where you're going to get scrutinized to not only the people next to you not only is the lighting way different because of the led lights and way different not only is the tans even darker now because the dyes they're using are way different and that also makes a big big difference but also because of the fact that all of these things put together are now being scrutinized that's why jay cutler says today online to make it into a one day show because the guys will be in better condition. You're still filming. You're still filming this thing in freaking high def. Right. You're, we're still seeing different levels of conditioning that is scrutinized under a greater lens than 4K. They didn't have 4K. They didn't even have 1080P. No, but that's what makes it actually more difficult on that's a physique. What I'm saying. Absolutely, it makes it actually worse because you have LED lighting with digital cameras. When you're using film, that's why Chris Lund stopped oh yeah, shooting. Man. Athletes, yeah. Yeah. Chris Lund, all those epic pictures that he would shoot, all those amazing photos that were done in the 90s and the 80s and 70s were shot on film. And when you showed them on film with the regular fluorescent lighting and not using LED lighting on a digital camera, the processor and all of those things wash everything out because they're working against one another. Where That's why when he ran out of film that he had to buy physically, Now he said, I'm done because I can't shoot on this digital format because it'll never look like when I shot on film. He told me that himself. Yeah. He goes, Hani, when I run out of film, physical film that he would have to have like buy from Japan or all these crazy places around the world. Right. And um, you can type up Chris Lund and you'll see some of his photos. And there were some of the most iconic photos of all the top bodybuilders of the day. And he said, this is why when I am finished with these amounts of film that, that's out there, there's only a certain amount of film, I'm not going to shoot digital because it's never going to look the same. Right. And, and, it, that, and it really doesn't. And it doesn't. It, it doesn't. You know, these, the uh, shout out to Chris Lund. I mean, he gave me some of the greatest moments of my bodybuilding career, you know. Um, Cliff I, Lund, I, L-U-N-D. I, I've talked to various uh, photographers outside of our sport, right? Mm-hmm. The ones that the the true OGs that know how to shoot on both formats, yep, laugh at the the guys that only know how to shoot on a mirrorless, because they're like this guy shoots on a mirrorless, but he doesn't know how to film like shoot on thirty five, and if they can find a thirty five, they it's like you got to be a savant, right? And again, back in the day, you know, they would take those slides and put them on a light board. And Joe would use the monocle and go through each fucking picture to make sure that the one that they selected was the best. Nowadays, shit, let's just go ahead and get someone exhaling, and that is the one that's going to be published. Right. That's that's the different types of scrutiny that you face. So it's a big, it's a a, a, a huge difference. It's it's a huge difference. I mean, you're going to get someone, you know, there's plenty of vloggers out there that will take a photograph, no different than like uh, a paparazzi person, to just to get engagement. That shows that they're a predator. That means that they're not trying to grow anything. They're just trying to grow their channel and make the athlete look like shit so much that majority of athletes, honey, in my opinion, like all of these photographers and all of these other vloggers so they don't have them uh, get shit talked. 
because if they mm -hmm. show love to them, then they're less they, they feel like they're hit. safe. Got it. You know who told me this? Who? The late Sean Roden. He really? Said, yeah, he was like, yeah, you take all the brunt from us. He goes from, you know, all these vloggers. I won't name them. He goes, oh, yeah, you take it all because you're the one that they focus on. They hyper-focus on every body part that you have. And I was like, you're right. And that's why I went in Generation I. I said they only criticize the best. It's fucking true because... They don't use the lens that they ever used on me. You know, it's funny. I was thinking about this the other day because I have to, you know, be a student of myself, right, to do the live commentary. I try mm -hmm. to and because I never talk about myself in a live commentary in this way of like, oh, back in my day, I just was like, I wonder how I could dissect myself because I want to do some reaction videos of like old appearances. Mm -hmm. I recognize the ones that are usually on there about like feels this like negative is always from prejudging. Mm. It's never in, I intentionally wore those purple trunks for prejudging for a reason, because then I could later on differentiate between prejudging and finals when you see the videos. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I realized I was like, they're judging me like, oh, like, let's say, oh, his stomach or this or that. And the other It's like, that was from prejudging. Show the finals, like show the night show shit, show the pose downs, like show those things. Right. You know how many times we would do these shows and the good pictures from the photographers wouldn't release until weeks later? Yeah. Then you'd all of a sudden And see then it. people That's would right. be like, oh, yeah, he did win. I'm like, fuck. Like, it's just so crazy. Yeah. So, you know, it's not about being a victim and saying they had a bad rap. It was just more one of those things because of the film Generation 9. It, it, created, a, it created a moment in time where there was a lot of conflict. And, you know, I had to learn from that. And I still get to use that as a, as a great learning lesson of how to deal with conflict in, externally and internally. And then realize, you know, got to put your best foot forward. You got to be better than expectations. That's the only way you're going to improve. You have to be better and better and better. And then when they make the fans a judge at the table, you got to just shrug it off. You can bitch for like 10 minutes. And then, and we bitched. We were like, what the fuck is this? Like, this yeah. is crazy. And then we realized this is the challenge round that Ronnie Coleman had to go through. Yeah. And they only do this for the best to make it entertaining. And that's tough, you know, uh, like, you know, for, for us, you know, but I can always rely on that dream killer mentality. And, and I go back to when we, it was going for number five. We were both extremely stressed. But then I realized, like, you were going, like, above. Like, you know, it was really getting you going. And I remember saying, I was like, bro, like, we've been here, man. We got to just stay calm. Like, let's just act like, like, did we just win our first one? Right. We've been here so many times now. Yeah. I and, think the biggest thing for me that I learned was right in the midst of your run was that it was never going to always be just you versus everybody else. It's always going to be you versus you. And they're always going to pull up photos of how you looked at your best. Yep. And how does he look now versus 11? How does he look now versus 13? How does he look now versus... It was always not just who you stood next to. And then I think also with your personality, obviously you and I have similarities, but we have some differences. And I feel like you embraced... And this is where I was explaining to somebody not too long ago. I think it was like earlier this year. Somebody said, well, what do you think about Phil Heath when Generation Iron came out and he ended up becoming a little bit almost toxic because of his anger and his frustration? And they said, well, it just depends on who you're talking to. I feel like you went from Spider-Man to Venom because you embraced the anger and you fueled it and it became just like a mutated version of where you were, but that's what drove you to seven. And that's where I said, like, this is where he has to elevate in his own way. I'm not going to sit there and try to bottle that up because that bottle has been opened. The genie's been let out. They forced it out well, and then they got mad. Yeah. And that's the funny thing. You know, I think, <laughs> you know, I, I think but that's why I'm saying that yeah. whole dream killer, like I'm oh, going to go out and dude, just cut their like, heads off, bro. And, and go, and, and that's where, like, again, you had that in your DNA already. And that's why I, when people ask, well, does everybody have to be that? I said, no, look at Seabum. He's not that way. Derek is a whole different person. Hottie's a different person. Um, you know, I think they all have Grammy, it. I think they all, all have it in them, honey. I, I, I think you have to be, I think a, a man, a, a man mm -hmm, mm -hmm. once pushed enough, pushed enough mm -hmm. 
beat down enough, it'll happen. Every man has his limit. Uh, Deion Sanders said this. Um, you know, they always say, take the high road. Yep. I remember Deion Sanders recently, you know, he's a coach at Colorado. Yep. Said, I lost the address to that place. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, and you know what? Why not? Because you know what? Sometimes those people that are going against you, that are talking that shit, they're playing that game. All right, let's go. Let's let's see what happens. And then when I whoop your ass, then you then you get mad. It's like, but you wanted the fight. You poked the bear, and the bear whooped your ass like that bear in the revenant, throwing Leonardo DiCaprio's ass ar- through his ass around. You got mad. Whoa, you you should be ashamed of yourself for thinking that I didn't have it in me to begin with. You forget who I had to beat to get here. That's the disrespect. You think you could disrespect Michael Jordan in his heyday? You've heard the stories of like a guy talking shit after the first half or the one game he caught him slipping. He came back and destroyed you. Why? So then we did what, honey? Beat him until what? Till they stopped screaming. And every man has that ability. It's just they haven't been pushed yet. There was a point in time, I wasn't being pushed there early on in my career and this and that, but when that happened, it pushed me to my limit. And I'm, I used it. Now, if I'm just running my mouth, like we've seen online, you know, there's internet personalities that compete. They run their mouth all the fucking time and they're doing it just to be entertaining so they can keep their fucking sponsorships. Let's just be real. Mm-hmm. And I get that. that. Kudos to them. I produced... I didn't just talk it, I walked it. I won and I dominated and they got mad. But you know what's funny? My lines are still long. I still get hired for appearances. I speak to kids, I do all those cool things that I still was doing almost 20 years ago because everybody loves a fucking champion. Everybody wants to know that if, look, we live in a really crazy, scary time right now and you and I just went shooting today. Mm-hmm. And why do we go shooting? To sharpen our skills in the event something really went down. Like I said, every man has it in them. It's those who are prepared to fight that win. Not the ones that want to play it nice. I'm a nice dude. You already know that shit. I'm the la- I'll laugh. I'll joke. I'll do this. You say enough and you talk enough shit. I'm going to show you who I am and you better be ready. And I, and I, I'm patting myself on the back for the fact that I didn't back down from that because it was required because of who I was going against to use that fuel. Went through divorce, went through my dad dying, went through his wife dying, went through friends and family turning their backs, doing stupid shit. I had friends that robbed me that all while being Mr. Olympia. That's tough. And you had to sit back and watch it. I did. So if, if I get mad in the gym and I go train my ass off and I do everything that you're telling me to do and more, and I produce a victory, look, man, I wouldn't change a damn thing. In fact, I probably wish I would have killed more people with those efforts. That's how I look at life. Like, I don't regret that shit. If anything, I should get an apology. You know what? I'll, I'll take that back. Anyone that has ever said something effed up about me or talked shit behind my back still to this day, I applaud you. I appreciated it because I was able to pivot and use it. And that goes for the people that are dealing with their own struggles now. I'm privileged to have gone through wars, not like our friend Toulon, who's a 23-year former Green Beret, has done real war, right? but in bodybuilding and be able to share stories of triumph, share stories that are relatable, that don't have to do with flexing, but have to do with sacrifice and commitment and discipline and coachability and accountability and closing the noise and still saying more. You never had to tell me, oh man, you're not doing enough cardio, Phil. God dang, man, I gotta get on a flight, man, because Phil's not listening. I was like, you would call me up and be like, what's your heart rate at? And I, Tell you while I was doing the cardio, like, man, back that shit off, bro, because we got a show to win. 
And I'm like, and I'm at like 156 on the step, high, now, killing it. And but yeah. it, I was like, if that's what it takes, yeah. I'll do it. Right. And you know, again, I would never change it. I I am living proof that if you try to live for everyone else, you'll be like everyone else. You'll be like everybody else, man. You won't be you. You were designed to something to be something one of one, man. And um, I have a great opportunity. I just, you know, I did the uh, live pay-per-view. I have my documentary, mm -hmm. Breaking Olympia. That, yeah, I do that, want to talk about that. The, when the, is that coming out? That's coming out late March of 2024. Mm -hmm. uh, Universal Global picked that up. Nice. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very much. And you got a co-producing co with Danny. Co-producer with Danny, Danny and, Garcia and, and, and Dwayne. You know, I couldn't have had the support that I got that I have with seven bucks with TGC, you know, the fact that Dwayne Johnson actually gave me over 30 minutes of his time to actually be interviewed. Um, that's priceless, man. That's awesome. You know, um, for him to narrate to, for him to show his face on a bodybuilding documentary mm -hmm. to have Danny be able to, you know, help orchestrate along with Adam Scorgi and Scorgi Productions, all those guys, Brett Harvey, shout out to Brett Harvey, the director, he did an amazing job. Um, you know, I'm eternally grateful for the opportunity because, you know, I was introduced to Breaking Olympia in 2017, 2018 with my uh, attorney, uh, Mark Bryant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once we started working on this and then, you know, it's funny, after I lost the Olympia in 2018, Danny called me. Mm -hmm. And that's when we started working on a, a, a relationship. Mm -hmm. And when she figured out that I already had a documentary in the work, she was like, no, let's, let's combine forces. Like, you know, let's do this. And we have, in my opinion, a documentary that is going to show the truth and to show pieces of me that are extremely vulnerable and that I am proud of. Because, you know, you only get so many opportunities in life to have your narrative be shared, but it's not like some, you know, some docudrama. This is not docudrama. This is like real shit. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just, like I said, I, I'm very happy. It's going to be on a lot of different video on demand platforms because it's universal. I mean, it's like, you know, so that's why I'm so excited about it. I mean, we, we plan on having a, you know, the, the press tour, all that stuff, you know, um, the premieres, of course, I'm going to invite you, you know, you better show up, you know, and get on the red carpet and <laughs> you give me a talk shit. Coupon. Yeah, you, I'll you, give, I'll give you me a discount. I give, I'll give you some free popcorn. I'll give you some popcorn, and you know, maybe you get, dude, like I can get you like a free hot dog or something. Oh you know, man, like, sure or, or like, like some free money. Like some, uh, uh, no, I give you some of those. Uh, what are they, uh, uh, hot tamales? Uh, uh, dipping dots and like a little, like little ice cream sandwiches. You know, yeah, I'll give That's you some of those. Funny. But yeah, no, I'm I'm very happy about it. I mean, we won two awards already over at the uh, Florence Italy uh, Film Festival oh, awards wow. for best, uh, I believe, best director and best uh, documentary. So yeah, I mean, we've we've. Universal has it. Is well, it? when you get closer to coming out, we got to talk about it. I Absolutely. haven't seen it yet. I want to look at it. Yeah, I want to see it. I show you. No, no, I'm saying like maybe tomorrow night. You know what I mean? Like if I can bump your son off of the freaking sticks, you know, with the PS5 joint on the big screen. If I can bump him off, <laughs> we got to ask permission for Cameron to let me. Oh, uh, I think chill. you can take him out. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, it, it's a uh, again, it's a it's a story about to me coming full circle. Um, showing bits and pieces of my life, my wife, Cherie, um, triumph through COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's very emotional. It's, it's not something where it's just all happy. And it's, it's, it's. Well, 2020 was a tough year. It was extremely tough year for you, for a lot of people, um, for, you know, it was just tough. And I'm I'm thankful that, you know, we filmed majority of it prior to 2020. And at that time, you know, you and I were just like, all right, well, I'm not going to do this shit no more. You know, right. I'm just going to kind of figure life out, you know. Um, and then life threw us curveball and right. <laughs> said pandemic. And then when the Olympia was ready to go again, we're like, all right, well, what do, we do? what we do is we take it as an opportunity to just say one more time, let's see. Mm -hmm. And you know, 
one of the things that I want to thank you for, one of the many things, is the belief in doing it again. Because going through two consecutive hernia surgeries and stuff like that, and it wears on me, right? Um, but just the years, the years of sacrifices that we both put in, the, the amount of work, you're almost like trying to figure out like how to end it, how to transition away from this because it's, it was, it's a lot. But then how do you honor it? And I felt like doing the 2020 Olympia was a way to honoring what we have done and, um, and continue to do. And that, and that was the best part. And that was one of the things that I had to learn from even uh, Dwayne. Um, he sat me down and he gave me some really good nuggets of wisdom because, of course, he's stepped, you know, he, st you know, he was, you know, multi, you know, 12-time 12, 12 champion in WWE and mm -hmm. went through everything. Stepped away, did other things, and now comes back here and there. And I had to learn through what he was sharing, which was don't do this for anybody but yourself. This one time. Try your hardest. But you got to commit. And, you know, hey, I'll do it for my dad. I'll do it for my moms. I'll do it for fans. I'll do it for my wife. Like, no, 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 no. At some point in time, it's got to be just for you. Just for you. And that's what that was about. And it was the only fucking time where we missed. But, you know, it's, it's um, 2020 was great because I actually got to see how people received me getting third. It wasn't happy. It wasn't sad. It was like, I mean, you were there. Yeah. It was quiet. I felt like it was a way for people to kind of see, like, how I would um, respond. Mm-hmm. And I still to this day feel like people were confused as to like, so what does this mean? Because this is weird. Like we haven't seen Phil not win two years in a row or, you know, in 18, sat out 19 and 20. Does this mean that this is like the last time? Like what does this really mm -hmm. mean? And for me it meant the first Mr. Olympia was, you know, you got third. In the 2020 you got third. Pretty third cool. on your way in, third on your way out. Yeah, pretty cool, you know. And um, you know, the like we talked about, what the measurement of a man is what, not when he's winning or, you know, when he gets knocked down a little bit. And, mm -hmm. But, you know, what was your um? Because I never really called you and asked. What was your thoughts after eighteen? Oh, the 18 was tough because I felt that they were ready for a change. Mm -hmm. And I felt like they, you were under maximum scrutiny because the previous years, last year or two, it was a lot of the circling on going on. Right. And I knew that they were going to really magnify your midsection. Mm -hmm. And I knew you had difficulty with it just in general because of the hernia. And it was one of those things where um, after you lost, that was a very tough year for me because Jeremy had lost that year and you had lost that year. And so it was a very, very tough year. And I'm like trying to understand if there was anything that I could have done any different. Right. At that point. Because that's what I do. Right. That's what I do. You know me for going on... 18 years, mm -hmm. right? And I think that it's uh, it's very difficult when you're somebody who's a control freak who knows that they don't have that control and there's nothing you could do about it and you try to replay it in your head and you say, okay, what could you do there? And, that, and then you go back and look at the pictures and, and pick it apart. And again, I'm always tough on you because I think that's what you need to be with your clients. You can't be soft on your clients and try to tell them how great they are all the time if you expect them to become great. And so I was just like, okay, I understand why the judges picked Sean, but there was nothing else I could do. So for me, I was just constantly replaying, is there you know, anything that I could have changed? And the answer is no. Yeah. I couldn't. 
because the injury had happened. The midsection was already becoming more problematic. You needed surgery. There was stuff that was going on. Your arms were great. Your back was great. Your legs were great. You know, this, your midsection just was not up to par for what they wanted. And there was nothing else at that point. So again, it was just at that point for me as a coach is just acceptance. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, it's wild. You know, but again, and what's crazy is also that, that when you fast forward a little bit, then people start to appreciate your physique a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And then they kind of come back and there's like, oh man, that, you know, you don't get too many guys that are that 3D or, or this or that. And it's kind of a cool feeling, but I always knew that was going to happen. It's like when people leave, they get a little bit more appreciated yeah. because it just sucks because you can't have that in the moment for whatever reason. It's mm-hmm. just human nature. I don't care what sport it is, whether it was Kobe when after he passed away or after, you know what I mean? Yeah, when they show the highlight reels, 10 years later, we haven't even, I mean, it's been three years. Right. But we talk about like my prime. I mean, still look at 17. I mean, fuck, dude. That, yeah, that 17 was, was solid. That was nasty. 13 was crazy. 16, yeah. dude. Yeah. I still think 16 prejudging. Yeah. I mean, Nisha was lights out, but like 16 prejudging was, mm-hmm. dude, that was when like the thickness. I remember you telling me, he was like, dude, you got to grow your ass. Like, you got to grow, like, you know, we got to, like, do more like adductor, abductor work. Like we got to get the width of these legs going and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, okay. And that's when the, those those hamstrings were getting roped. I mean, they, they, we talk about piano. Yeah. Like that Steinway, like that you know, hamstrings. Like real shit, bro. Like when people would be like, oh man, they got shredded hamstring. I'm like, you sure you talking? You ain't talking about me. Yeah. Real shredded hamstrings. Yeah. Like, you know, like, you know, people would be like, oh yeah, this guy got really good hamstring. I'm like, bro, we, what we were bringing, yeah. like that shit. And I just, you know, it's funny, like, prejudging was always something, like, of joy because um, I would try to, because you would be like, hey, you got to find me, <laughs> you know? Um, because it's not like today where coaches are allowed backstage. We created such badassery. Yeah. We people don't yeah. realize this, man. Like we created such there bad ass yeah, that <laughs> coaches were no longer allowed, and they would tell Hani, "You can't be backstage." And then you'd call, you'd text me, and be I'd like, have text "Everybody's you. back here, but you." Yeah, I'm like George Fair back here. You got this guy's back here. I was yeah, like, you'd say Neil would be back. Neil there. back here. Yeah. Everybody. And then they yeah. find like a person to to be like the trainer, the trainer to help with somebody. And I'm like, man, they only doing this shit because we over here. Beating everybody's ass, <laughs> and uh, but, you but know it was, it's a whole it's a whole different thing now. But but I think though, Phil, I wouldn't have changed anything. About no, it dude, it because, would be great, man. Because you would just text me when you get off of the stage after your individual round. I'm like, you know, thumbs up, thumbs up. Yeah, you and know, then fire like, emoji, fire emoji. Yeah, you're like, do or, you're or like do this. You're like, drink some more car powder, do this, yeah. and uh, make sure you don't let up at all. Yeah. Uh, crowd that line a little bit harder. <laughs> yeah, make sure they're not creeping up on don't you. Don't let them. Cr- don't, let creep Dexter, up on, don't let Dexter. Don't let Dexter creep up on you. Don't let them creep up on the line and this and that, and, and go a little bit more aggressive or this that. Dexter, and, Dexter's uh, good at that too. Dexter oh, they always. Was, oh, they always. When he would do it. He would do it in the middle of his changing, like when he was fixing his uh, oil. Oh, when he's bro, fixing his oil. These guys. They, these guys always try to point me out for that, and it, I'm it, like, yeah, okay. But it was always cool because I felt like one of the the best things I could do on stage was find you in fairness mm-hmm. you know sitting near john witty mm-hmm. and i could find you yep and then i could it's very weird man i could tune everybody out and i could hear you mm-hmm. and i'm like okay and you and you and it was just like like there would be some years you're like fuck bro <laughs> <laughs> and there's some ones no, that you're like, like you're fight. like okay yeah yeah you let's go fight. yeah and it was let me ask you like what was your favorite like Top three. Favorite shows? Not just Olympic. Like, this top three. Not in order. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, top three. With you? Yeah. I would say, man, they're so different. I thought. Or just give me three. I think that the first one was special. The The first Olympia or the first Olympia? First show ever. Oh, the first show ever, yeah. Because it was special because it was the unknown. Yeah. And I just remember you were so scared, you were so nervous, and but 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 you were so tuned in to 
tell me what we got to do. Because you're coming from a place of complete, like, just being a novice, right? Yeah. I mean, you were just starting your pro career. It was your first pro show ever. And I think that was very special. I remember you come into the room and we were dialing you in. And I'm like, okay, we're going to do this and this. And you were just, like, intent on, like, okay, just tell me exactly what to do. And I'm like, sip this, eat this, drink this, you know? And it was like, in this order. And it was like, done. And then that was very, very special because it was the first one to kind of set the tone. And I feel that that comes to mind. I think 2011 was a little bit like the haughty Derek situation a little bit because I don't even feel like you even enjoyed beating Jay that much. It was never about me beating Jay at all. It was about being Mr. Olympia. Yeah. I had to really, you know, your friends are your friends, right? You know, that your fans are like, no, you're going to beat Jay. And I was like, but Ugh. you guys don't realize, yeah. like, you can't even, like, I can't do that with a friend. I got to be Mr. Olympia. Mm -hmm. Because what if Jay don't show up? Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I got to be, I got to be. Mr. Olympia. That means no matter who comes. Mm -hmm. And that was the easiest way for me to deal with it. So then I didn't get soft. Right. Because I knew, I, you know, I could be soft with a friend. Right. Um, so I was like, it's not about beating Jay. Um, it was about becoming number 13. Right. That's why I did the video called Becoming, becoming number, 13 number 13. Because I had to create that video saying that in order for me to stay focused on winning the title. It had nothing to do with the person I stood next to. It had to be about winning that, that Sandow. And I think 2013. 2013 was big because it was right after all the noise. Yeah, dude. And it was like the noise of the Generation Iron, all of the, you know, you started, after you win a couple, then that's when they start to really turn on you. Mm -hmm. And you went from like, you know, Rocky, to like Mr. T, you know, the guy that they don't like and Clever Lang. <laughs> and it's like one of those things was like, I'm just looking at it going back and going, okay, well, when you went in there and you went decisively won that year, then it was just that, you know, when they put you to the side, mm -hmm. Big Steve called you out, you did your first couple of uh, mandatory poses and then they put you to the side. Then I was like, okay. You know, 2013. Were you just like, okay, or were you like, God dang, bro? Like, they, this is like, because I, I, mm, I'm no, trying to remember, like, I, in, I, the way I you do, think, like, I remember I'm you not, coming back to the it, room and being like, this shit ain't over, bro. Yeah. Like, this exactly, shit ain't over, man. Exactly. Like, you got to come out Saturday night. You yeah. never know what they're going to do, man. They might. <laughs> Well, you got to remember, I get that's it. what 2010 did to me. Yeah. It traumatized the shit out of us. Yeah. Man. Well, and it rightfully so. Yeah. Because you're not done till you're done. All right. Until you have that trophy in your hand, it's not over. Nope. So, and now you have two days, right? And we've seen what can happen between the morning and night, let alone from one day to the next. Yep. So you have to, it doesn't matter how hard you hit that first home run in that first inning, you got to finish the ninth inning and still win. Yeah. And that's, you got to still be ahead mm -hmm. by the time the game is over. Right. And that's what it's about. So for me, I just never was able to really relax. Yeah. You know, but it was one of those things where it did feel good, especially afterwards when you go back and you replay it. Oh. And that's that that was the best part that's, of that. That's one of those videos where like, you know, you get people online, you know, they they take <laughs> they take these Olympia videos and they create the TikToks and they some of the music, I'm like, God dang, man, you guys use like terrible ass music for this. And sometimes they use some really good ones. Uh -huh. Fortunately for me, I have like the the actual digital, like the disc. Mm-hmm. And I've watched those every so often. Like we're talking about, like once every like three, four years, mm -hmm. like five years, maybe. And um, because you, you know, what it is is I like to watch the videos that were licensed, in addition to the ones that someone took from the audience that snuck in a DSLR, uh -huh. because you can hear the reaction of people in the audience and your own posing music when you. Mm. You know, I, I felt like um, sometimes it'd have to cut out the music. Yeah, because of licensing. And, that, and that's and that's the shitty part. But then also, I'll just keep it real, bro. Like after 2014, it 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 was harder because 
it was streamed. So streaming in 2014 versus 2020 or 2023 is completely different. So you're actually seeing a digitized version of a, of a physique that it doesn't look the same. No, you don't get to see the quality. So you don't get to see the quality, quality and shit. Right. So it, I always believe that it should still be authored on disc mm -hmm. just for future because there, I bet you there's plenty of people, including myself, like if, let's say there's yeah, a- Yeah, but you're a true fan, man. It's Because I want to see the quality, you I know, know what I'm saying? I know, because you're like, a true fan. Because if I'm you're watching- You're the guy the, that I yeah. go to your house and you'd have 400 DVDs of movies because you wanted to watch them all on Blu-ray. You need to have them watch them at, in ultra high def because you are a, I got to see the, de the like, detail. Sheree just made fun of me the other day and shout out to wifey, you know, like she was like, you just find shit in films- <laughs> and TV, <laughs> and when we're walking around, you just like see stuff and can comment on it. I was like, I was born to be a point guard, right? Basketball, you have to be able to see certain things, and then as right. a bodybuilder, you gotta hyper-focus on certain details, and um, yeah, I, I, I wanna um, be able to utilize those videos from back in the day that were on disc, because I don't think people realize the compression that you have from streaming to, yeah. you know, it's, it's just different. But to hear the, the audience, mm. you know, one of the one of the um, one of the wishes that I do have, and I, and I, I don't know if I shared this, is that when I die, I want to, I want God to say, "Great job." <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> this is real. This is heaven. I'm like, okay, cool. We got that out of the way. But then also, um, would you like to see some of the highlights? And I'd be like, absolutely. I want to see what it looked like when I hit my first basket. Like with my own eyes, not through a, a camera lens. Mm -hmm. I want to see what it was like to graduate college. I want to see first kiss. I want to see um, some failure. I want to see my first bodybuilding show in the audience. I want to see what everybody else saw, but with my eyes. I want to see even me losing in 2018. I want to know. I just want to see it. I want to be able to be in the audience and kind of like look around. But I want to see those things because, you know, the eye can catch these things that cameras can't. And I don't, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, you yeah. ever think about that? Like, the things that you've done, could you imagine, like, replaying the film of Honey Rambod? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Like, to be able to see it, because then you're like, damn, bro, like, that was so cool. Like, imagine, like, you, whatever it is, like, your wedding day, the birth of your son. Yeah. You know, like, I, I to see, like, to see you, like, you're seeing you. And I think that that would be one of the greatest gifts. I don't know what heaven looks like, but maybe we have an opportunity to see stuff like that. But that was, I think like halfway through my career, I was like, man, because I don't know if you remember, but like you would come to the meet and greet on Thursday night mm -hmm. to remind my ass to eat yeah. <laughs> and to get up off my feet yep. and leave. And what would I do? I would always go up to that stage. I'd find a way to go to that Olympia stage. Mm-hmm. And I'd have a moment of visualization about what the hell we're about to unleash on these MFers. And I used to sit there sometimes. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of things that you did that's very different. Because you look at things, just like what you're saying right now, I, I absolutely agree with you. But I think that, you know, when, and I told you, this is why this podcast was going to be so, so tough. Because we're unpacking almost twenty years of history together. Yeah, that's why it's not going to. It's not going to stop. I mean, we got to stop soon. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure. we're going to. But yeah. uh, but it know. keeps going because yeah. of the fact that there's so much there. There's so much things that we've talked about and had conversations about with triumph, with heartache, with all of the stuff that's gone on, and it's very, very emotional. But the biggest thing is, it's been such key takeaways. And I mean, you were there with you know at my wedding. You were part of my wedding. You were there for me when my dad was passing away. Yeah. Yeah. Look, 
You were there for me when mine did, you know? It's, it's like the hardest things to deal with and no one understands. It's like they're, they're not supposed to, you know? A lot of relatable things that, and I don't like want to discredit anyone that's ever going through pain and hardship, but it's tough when you're on display for the world to see your performance day after day and year after year, and, it, and you can't fail. And I try to explain this the best I can right now and when I public, do public speaking, that winning the Olympia or having that type of success, you're kind of like on this crazy ass roller coaster. And you kind of just have to hold on for the unexpected twists and turns and dips and, and you just have to hold on. And there's times where you, the G forces and stuff, it feels like you're gonna die. And you see other people on that thing and they're passing out, they can't hang out, they can't, but you have to hang on. You have to ride this out. And I just feel like we collectively held on and we still do. No one will understand what your struggle has been from the minute you were born, honey. I know a lot more than the average person, and that's why I did this podcast. And I wanted to wait because even for myself, I, I had to be able to be in a place to really honor what we had accomplished together and what you have done individually as well. For you to go through what you went through in 2020, I was just like, I get it. I didn't like it, you know, because COVID, you know. Um, of course, I would want to be there with you. And it's just, and but we were like no different than probably another million people. Yeah. That couldn't connect with our loved ones. Couldn't be, I couldn't be there for one of my best friends. And I guess what I can take away from it is that you have to be extremely present when you are together and have to respect the fact that we're not always going to be, I don't live here, right? But when we are here, we are here. If we have an hour, that's been the hour. We don't answer the phone. We don't look at the phone. Like as much as we are patterned to check yeah. stuff and be at the dinner table and do those things, it's like we can't because we just don't know when the expiration of our lives will happen and what memories are missed. One of the biggest things that I feel like we missed were the pictures of you and I together after beating everybody's ass. But I still have the memories of us being at the nightclub and, mm -hmm. you know, pouring a drink and cheers. And then there's pictures of us that I do have, not of every year, but a few. A couple here and there, yeah. Of us just like, our heads are together and we're just like closing our eyes like, mm -hmm. we did it again. And we're taking a brief moment of exhaling. And everybody's like, yeah, yeah. And I didn't, and you know, honey, I never even, I couldn't hear the music. All I heard was just like, we we did this and they can't fucking take it because we earned it and we really earned it. Yeah, you you did. I was just a part of the ride, man. I mean, I, I appreciate all the credit, but you, you, you went through those struggles and I was blessed enough to be a part of that journey with you, but you did it, dude. I mean, you had to go through so much shit and um, wild. Yeah, man. It's the book well, that we get to write, <laughs> you know, and I have to smile about it, dude, because we're, you got to think of, um, honey, would you really have it any other way? You could say yes, but it's like, it's about how you can harness the energy strength and the perseverance and all the things that we read about online that people say but they say it but you're doing it 
And to me, that's what's admirable, is that when you say sacrifice, when you say discipline, when you say hard work, you know what it means in yourself and in others. And you point out the bullshit. And you know how to channel it. And it's not easy. You know, I always think of like pool, what's it called? Pool hall junkies with Christopher Walken talking about the that lion speech. Yeah. You know, at some point in time, man, you gotta, you know, and I will say again, like part of my competitive nature and spirit and ferocity was because of the fact that you had to deal with a lot of shit too that people don't know. And I was like, if you ride with me and you did throughout the entire career, I will whoop anyone's ass that thinks that we can't do this. And I will show them. And I just think it's the, the way you honor friendship. I think you fight. I think um, when you came to the room after the prejudging in 2018 and you were like, it's not looking good, man. And I was pissed at you for a second because I'm like, I don't want to hear this right now. Yeah. But then I had to take a step back and say, well, Phil, you think he wanted to tell you this? You really think your boy wanted to tell you this after all these years? And I remember with Sheree and with Mark and I was trying to calm them down because they were like, what the fuck, man? Like, you can't just tell us this and walk out. And I'm like, yes, you can. Because it's all on what I got to do right now. And I was like, well, fight then. Fight for it. Fight as hard as we can. And, um, you know, you've had, you have to deal with, you know, as a coach, winning and losing and winning and losing at the same fucking time. I mean, you just experienced it. We were just at the Olympia, you know? Yeah. You know, everybody that's listening, you know, uh, you don't want this job. You don't you, you don't want this job. You you say you want to be a coach. You 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 really <laughs> like you do not want this job. Like Honey Rambo can say that he's trained all these people and had all these titles and shit like that and you know, drive nice vehicles and have a company and have all this really good stuff. You do not want this job. Don't even sign up because you're not willing to go through these struggles. And you say you are, but pff, there's coaches that like like be acting like they you by winning a Arnold Classic as a coach, pull up the stat sheet, man. Like you didn't just help people win. You help people dominate. You gave them, and even maybe some of your clients don't realize this. You pour into people, man. You don't let up. I've never seen you be soft on a client. In fact, some clients have left only to then try to come back because they went around to different coaches and realized what they really needed was a real coach that would tell it like it is. And that's a version of love that they really needed all along. So, you know, it's, it's never easy being a badass. It's never easy being a coach. I mean, it would be a lot easier for you and you probably would have a little bit more hair on your head if you're a lot lighter on people, but that's just not you. And you'll never be that person, but you know who you always will be. You'll always be a person of high standards. I, I, I can never, I would, I can never, um, I can never see you not having standards. You know, I mean, look at your wife. She has standards, right? Yeah. Smart, beautiful, intelligent, you know, great mom, like just compliments you, your son. Kid has freaking standards, dude. Like this kid, like I'm gonna hire him. By the way, I'm totally stealing him <laughs> from you. Like, at some point, I got to figure out a way to hire your son. But it's a culmination of just hard work ethic, never saying quit. Um, when people tell you no, you kind of silently flip them off and keep going, and you know you leave them in the dust. And then when they come around and kind of congratulate you, you kind of kind of look at them and be like, I know. I know. I knew all along. And that's why I never tell you I'm proud of you because I knew all along. 
That's why I stuck with you because I knew all along. Would have never. And they could take this however they want. The, the, the personalities of the other people that are coaches could never withstand what I went through. They wouldn't know what to do. And that's why they don't have champions. Well, I think that you have definitely set a bar, especially with the amount of adversity you went through. But again, not a lot of that was shared. You have people who share things and you didn't. Um, and I, you know, maybe in your own time, I mean, when you write your book, write the you book, know, you know, do your thing. Yeah. Have but, the, have the breaking Olympia, you know, video yeah. that'll catalyst a lot of different things that we have going on. Uh, you know, I have my podcast that's being built right now, the nice. studio right now. And, um, you know, 2024 is definitely a year that I'm, I'm coming. Well, I can't wait to see your next chapter, brother. Yeah. I mean, uh, thank you for coming. Thank yeah. you for, you know, being out here. I mean, it means a lot to me. I know this was something that you definitely needed at your own time for this. And I totally understood. And I said, hey, when it's, when it's the right time, we'll take care of it. That's why I never pressured you into doing this podcast. Because I knew that um, it was going to be emotional for both of us. But I do appreciate all the kind words. And I appreciate your faith in me to be your coach. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, of course. And let's go get some food, man. Let's go get some food. Yeah, let's get some food. This is. Uh, I thought we were going to train and shit. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. you know, we got reservations. See, that's the cool thing about not having to. Get ready for a show. Get ready for a show. <laughs> you can have plans and be like, oh, yeah, we're going to train and we're going to do this. And then we're like, you know, yeah. this was a lot more valuable. And I and I, I appreciate you. I'm glad that um, you've taken this podcast to a whole new level and having this amazing studio and your crew and um it's also motivated me to start my own so that's great we'll have to have you on mine one day 100 percent. and wait. and uh i'll train you i don't know there you go I mean, and there then you I'll, go. I'll, I'll but there you got to wear the wig oh the wig <laughs> the wig the one that was in the, on, on <laughs> yeah, the internet wear, 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 brother wear. thank you so much uh, thanks brother yeah no, seriously yeah. yeah we have a lot more to talk about guys again um you know, I appreciate everybody here. Obviously, follow Phil on his many, many channels. And um, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's followed our journey, especially the ones that have been around for a long time. Yeah. Hani Rambod, seven-time Olympia winner, Phil Heath. And that's the truth. Yay. We did it. We did it. <laughs>